this is about a road trip um, that did happen in, uh, in 1915. Can you all hear me all right? Um, and I call it We Demand uh, America's First Cross-Country Automobile Trip for a Cause, because it wasn't, in fact, the first ever automobile trip across the, across the US, nor was it the first one undertaken by women. But to my knowledge, it was the first one undertaken for a cause, and that cause was women's suffrage, um, women's voting rights. So let's uh, advance the slides. All right, so these are the, uh, this is kind of going in and out. Uh, these are the original, these are the three women who made the whole trip. And uh, we have Sarah Bard Field, um, Maria Jeanberg, and Ingeborg Jinstedt. So Maria and, and Ingeborg, Ingeborg were both naturalized U.S. citizens but had emigrated from uh, Sweden, um, you know, around 1890 or so. Uh, they didn't come at the same time. They didn't know each other in Sweden. But, um, and, and this is the, the, you can see the We Demand banner on the car. It says, We Demand an Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and Franchising Women. All right, so next slide. So let's just ponder this for a minute. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, women didn't have the right to vote. And you know, it had been a, a really long time uh, that they had been working on this. Um, they had, it, it, you know, it had been 126 years since uh, the US Constitution was adopted. And if you, if you date it from the time that uh, the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention uh, it had been 67 years that women had been working nonstop on trying to get the right to vote. And no other group of white men, anyway, had had to work anywhere near as hard to, uh, to, to get the right to vote. So, uh, you know, this is sort of, it's sort of extraordinary in U.S. history that, um, that people had to work this hard to get the right to vote. Um, up to this point, uh, a lot of the progress that had, made on, uh, had been made on women's suffrage was done um, state by state. And in a state campaign, you had to first persuade the state legislature to pass a statewide referendum. And then you had to persuade the men of the state to uh, give women voting rights through that process. And by this time, there had been over 500 state campaigns. Um, and only 12 states and one territory had given women the right to vote. So just an extraordinary amount of effort on the part of women uh, when they could have been putting their, you know, labor, their, their blood, sweat, and tears behind other causes that they cared about. Um, but all of the states were west of the Mississippi. Uh, so, um, you know, the progress had been made, but at the rate they were going, it was going to be another 100 years before women got the right to vote. So, uh, next slide. Um, so, you know, this, there's Elizabeth Cady Stanton on the right and Susan B. Anthony on the left, and of course they were the famous duo who had, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had, had, you know, organized the Seneca Falls Conference, and these two had done a lot to promote suffrage all, over all those years. Okay, next slide. Um, but in 1913, uh, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns who had worked in suffrage in England decided that they should, they came back to the United States and wanted to, wanted to say, you know, forget about these state campaigns, it's far too slow, let's just go get an amendment to the Constitution enfranchising women. And to do that, they're going to hold the political party in power accountable for failing to move the federal amendment through Congress. So in, in 1912, Wilson gets elected, he's got a majority in both houses of Congress, and so the Democrats are in control of the executive branch in Congress. Um, and he's going to come up for re-election in 1916. Um, so by the way, I mean, there are a lot of people holding a party accountable for doing something or not doing something. We don't even blink at that today. But this was a huge deal at, back in 1915. It was uh, the more staid suffragists of the National American Women's Suffrage Association thought this was a terrible idea. They didn't want to see women uh, you know, getting sullied by the dirty politics of the day, and that's exactly what they were proposing to do. All right, next slide. So they're going to use the, by this time, four million uh, women have the, vote, the right to vote, and they're all in those western states, like I said, the, those all are in yellow, and uh, Illinois had presidential suffrage, what, which is why it gets a yellow uh, spot there. Um, um, and 
they're going to use, they're, what they plan to do is, let's get those women out west to vote as a block. And if we do that, then we can determine the outcome of the, president, the presidential election. And so everybody's kind of like, well, can that be done? And we don't know. It's never been done before. Let's give it a shot. So that's what they're really up to. You can see this means the freedom for women to vote against the party this donkey represents. Uh, women of Colorado already had the right to vote. So this is just reminding them, this is actually, I think, in the 1916 election, um, <clears throat> that they could, they, they're asking to vote against Woodrow Wilson and the Democratic candidate for, for Congress. Um, and this down here says, our hat's in the ring. Um, so they're, they're really, they're going for it. Um, okay, so that's kind of the backdrop, background for this. Yeah, next slide. And um, so we're at the, so in 1915, uh, there's the um, Panama Pacific International Exposition. And uh, the Congressional Union says, well, let's have a booth at the exposition. Something like 19 million people from all over the world are going to come and we can get people to sign a petition demanding an amendment to the Constitution because they're all going to be stopping by our boot. So that's what they do. Uh, here's a shot of the exposition. And uh, next slide. And they have their own booth. They're the only suffrage organization at the exposition. And this is, a, this is what their booth looked like. In the back, you, you can't see it very well, but they actually had uh, dolls from the enfranchised you know, women, the states where women had the vote vote. And the women, those women were all dressed, those dolls were all dressed in sort of brightly colored clothes and the dolls looked happy. And then they had kind of behind a barrier in more sober and depressing clothes, the women representing the, the um, states where women didn't have the right to vote. Um, and they had this petition uh, demanding an amendment to the Constitution enfranchising women and they asked um, women especially to, to sign that petition as they came through the booth. And um, so starting in January, uh, they, they start this process, and by September, they say they have over 500,000 signatures on this petition. And the plan, the great and glorious plan, is to have uh, the petition driven across country, uh, sort of launched by the, the world's first ever convention of women voters. Um, and they're going to launch these envoys eastward toward DC with the petition to bring it to Congress and the president, and, um, and you know, just showing that all these women voters want the right to vote, or want all women to have the right to vote in the country. Okay, so next slide. And here's, a, here's a, the call. Um, the suffragist was the National Women's Party. I, I actually, I think I neglected to say that it was the Congressional Union which became the National Women's Party, which, was, which is behind this huge trip. And this is, the suffragist was their weekly newspaper. And you can see uh, she's, she's putting out the call for women's enfranchisement, called the Women Voters Convention in San Francisco, September 14th, 15th, and 16th. So in the months leading up to this, they send organizers out to all those Western states where women have the vote. And they say, send, send some delegates to this convention. And they all respond. And so they have this, um, you know, they have this convention. But they have this little problem. Let's go to the next slide. Um, oh, yeah, so they have this little problem that they don't know, they don't have a car. They don't have a lot of money, and they don't have a car, and they don't know who can drive. And, and they had planned, they actually had written in the suffragists, they had published that they were going to send 100 cars across country in this, in this envoy, you know, uh, convoy. And, um, and they didn't know. I mean, it was like two or three weeks before the convention, they didn't have a plan for this. And then, so Maria and Ingeborg show up at the, at the exposition. They had taken the boat out um, from, they lived, they lived in Rhode Island, and uh, they made it through the Panama Canal just before uh, there was a huge mudslide that blocked it up. And, um, uh, and they show up at the suffrage booth at the exposition, they say, oh, well, we're actually planning to buy a car and uh, drive back to, to, to Rhode Island because we've traveled around Europe and we've gone back to Sweden and stuff, but we've never seen America, so this was going to be our trip. So we'll take the envoy with us. And like, praise, praise the Lord, oh, yeah, yeah, you can do this. So Alice and Paul is really excited because they're actually not asking for payment either, which is a big deal. So they don't have to pay for, uh, uh, what happened to Ingeborg? Huh, Let's go to the next slide and see what happens. Yeah, there she is. Um, so, so um, we actually go back one slide. 
Um, we'll see Maria, well, two slides, I guess, yeah. So Maria is 55 years old at the time of this trip. She has been a, a midwife. She's delivered over 2,000 babies by her estimate. And um, she knows, how, she's had a draw, she already had a car back in, in Providence. That's how she, um, she got around to see her, her customers, her patients. And, and um, so she, 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 and she was the one who had the wherewithal to buy the car. Uh, so, um, and it cost 550 bucks. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So, okay, next, next photo is uh, Ingeborg. And Ingeborg was 50 years old at the time of this trip. She was the mechanician, as it was called. She was a mechanic. She actually knew how to, how to uh, sort the car out. She could jack it up, or yak it up, as they called it, and, um, and change a tire, patch a tube. Uh, she, she knew the mechanics of it. Um, and she kept the car running. They did resort to service stations from time to time, but, um, but Ingeborg was the mechanic. All right, next, um, next slide. And Sarah Bardfield was the envoy. There were actually two envoys who were launched from the convention. The second was a woman named Frances Joliffe, but she made it as far as Sacramento before bailing. And um, so it was really just the three of them that went across the country in the car. Uh, next slide. Oh, actually, I should say, Sarah was, a, she was about 35 years old. She didn't know how to drive. Uh, she knew nothing about cars. And, um, and she was a poet, um, suffrage organizer. She was divorced. Uh, she had a lover who was 30 years older than her. And um, then she was, in, he lived up in Oregon. Uh, she lived in San Francisco at the time. And, and, um, and the reason why we know so much about this trip is because of the letters that she wrote to her lover across, as she moved across the country. Mabel Vernon was a, um, a suffragist, uh, suffrage, uh, you know, kind of a lieutenant um, of Alice Paul's, and uh, she was the advance organizer. And so she went, she hopscotched across the country in front of them by train and would set up, she would engage the meeting hall, she would get the local suffragists behind uh, coming out for a rally and, and get things set up for them. She later said that this was the hardest thing she'd ever done in her life. Her, her health was never the same. And she's really kind of the unsung hero of the trip because uh, it, that was really hard work. And she was by herself, too, by the way. At least the others had each other. All right, next slide. And the, 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 the other character in this whole trip is the car, of course, which was an Overland 6 built by the Willis Overland Company of Dayton, Ohio. And um, they, I think, in, that, in those days, there weren't just a handful of automobile manufacturers. There were probably like 60 of them. And, and, um, and in order to grab market share, the Overland Company dropped their price to 550 bucks, advertised in various language newspapers. I, I found an ad for it in the, in the Swedish language newspaper. And, um, and made it a, and promoted it heavily at the, the Panama Pacific International Exposition. So 550 bucks for this car, great little car. And you can see that they had to strap their luggage to the outside and, um, and on the other side are cans of gas and, and, and water and that kind of thing, oil. Uh, so w what's missing from the car is a top. You know, so you can see that they they left San Francisco at the end of September, and they didn't pull into to Washington D.C. until early December. Uh, so, and they it was cold. Well, I'm here to tell you. Uh, so we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, next slide. Um, so here we are. We're back at the Court of Abundance. This is where the last they've had the, the three days of the convention. This is the the last night of the convention is going to take place in this. Uh, or, or in this court of abundance, it was called at the Panama Pacific. And um, they had uh, a chorus lined up on the steps in the back here. And there were, it was jam packed. They claimed there were 10,000 people there. You know, I don't know if that's true. But they had darkened the lights. And, um, and there was, they, the architect had created this thing where steam shot up from these vents all, over, all around the pool. So it was very sort of mystical and kind of. Uh, uh, I don't know, swampy or something, and and um, and uh, so they have already chosen finally who the envoys will be, and they're getting ready to launch them. And so they they uh, the the envoys appear on stage, Sarah and, and uh, Francis Jolif, and and the the Swedes pull up in their car. The envoys get in the back of the car, and, and, um, and everybody lights these lanterns, and they escort the car to the gates of the Panama Pacific Exposition. The gates swing open at their approach, and they disappear into the night. 
And so that's, it's a very dramatic scene and, and, um, and it's very effective. They actually didn't leave San Francisco for 10 more days at least, but they kind of went into hiding. I think they needed to get the car registered or something. I'm not exactly sure what the deal was, but you know, there wasn't like FedEx and things like that to happen, to make things happen across the country. Um, so it took a while, but, but um, anyway, they, they take off and they go up to uh, Sacramento is their first stop and that's when Francis bails on them and, um, and so they continue on. I could go to the next slide. This is a map of their itinerary. It's a little bit hard to see here, but this is, was drawn by Amelia Fry, who's a historian who, who really um, was the one who initially researched this story. So here's Sacramento. They go to Reno and across Nevada um, and, and over to Salt Lake City. Uh, and over to, um, you know, through southern Wyoming, down to Denver, Colorado Springs, um, and um, let's see, yeah, Kansas, and they go up to, uh, around through Kansas City, and they're hanging out there for several days, in Nebraska, um, and over to Iowa, they're in Chicago, down to Annapolis, up to, uh, uh, through Ohio to Detroit, back down to Cleveland, and then into western uh, New York, and then over and down the eastern seaboard to D.C. So that's the route, and uh, it gets changed a little bit from time to time, but, but um, that's where they're headed. And uh, the red circles are when they're sort of more uh, eventful things happen. Let's go to the next slide. So they're following in the initial part of the journey something called the Lincoln Highway, which uh, you know, it, it's sort of an aspirational <laughs> name. Uh, the Lincoln Highway was really just a cart trap track most of the way. Um, it would get rained out and, and flooded out and, you know, muddy and everything else. But the, you can see it kind of follows their route, uh, at least as far as Chicago. Um, so, uh, all right, next slide. Um, so how was the trip? Well. You know, we, so my husband and I went on the same trip, um, leaving San Francisco around the time this, they did, um, sort of late September. And um, this is a shot of the salt flats uh, a little east of uh, Reno, Nevada. And I'm here to tell you, it was hot. And I bought a new car in San Francisco also, and I had air conditioning, and I was still this swelling water. It was so hot and dry. And how they made it across the desert, I will never know. I mean, heading, heading um, east of, of, uh, of Reno, there's, you go across the, the Nevada's Great Basin. Has anybody ever driven that? Uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You go up, you go across the desert floor, and then you climb up over this mountain pass, and, and then you drop down to the desert floor again, and you go across the desert floor for, I don't know, 100 miles or something, you know, 50 miles, and then you climb up another one, and this goes on for days. You know, I, I don't know how they managed it. Um, and if for a while, after a while, you start feeling like you're not going anywhere, just this scenery is kind of all the same, and it's all going past you um, in this weird slow motion. Thing. So, and these are the salt flats. It's not the alkali flats. They, they, it isn't all like this, but it, it just must have been really miserable. Um, so, next, next slide. Um, at times, Sarah writes that they're uh, they're plowing up dust. There's so much, you know, it's so much loose dust. It's just kind of you can just imagine it's kind of coming past the car window or sides of the car in this big kind of rolling mass. And and this isn't from their trip, but it's from a a museum in Nevada that where we stopped. And um, so you can sort of get a sense of how, what that must have been like for them. All right, next slide. Um, changing a tire in the desert, not, a, not an easy thing to do. These are more like bicycle tires. So they had tubes in them. You had to patch the tube. Um, so if it's dusty, of course, it's not easy to do that. And, and um, so this is, again, this isn't their trip, but these are three guys trying to patch a tube on a car, uh, similar era. Um, I, I, she, she patched a dozen tires, I think, on her way, their way across the country, uh, Ingeborg did. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so they make it to, oh, I sh actually, I, I should say that it wasn't easy to get to Salt Lake City. So from Reno, they get into Reno and they get a kind of a triumphant uh, welcome there because uh, Sarah Bard Field had done some organizing, some suffrage organizing there, and so she knows a lot of people and that's a lot of fun. And then they get kind of worried because they have to go across several hundred miles of desert, uh, the, the Great Basin, and, and it's a little bit like Amelia Earhart trying to find that island in the Pacific. They had to find a ranch 
where they were going to spend the night. And, um, and they, they just weren't sure if they knew exactly where to find it because Alice Paul had sent them off without a map. And um, so they, they, and of course there weren't road signs and things like that. So they were a little worried about this. So they hired a driver who claimed that a man who said he knew the way. Um, so that didn't go well. They get lost in the desert at night. And all of a sudden it's midnight. They should have been at this ranch two hours before. And Sarah's like, where are we? And he said, I don't know. I think we're on such and such a road, but uh, I, I think we're lost. So they're freaking out. I mean, it really is like being in the middle of the ocean, except that they, they are on dry land. But there's nothing. There's no lights. You know, they can't. They have no no idea where they are. They get to this crossroads, and they're out looking around with their lantern for some kind of sign. And they find these cowboys rolled up in their blankets, asleep at the side of the road. And they wake them up, and they say, "Where the heck are we? And and how do we get to the Ibapa Ranch?" And they say, "Oh man, you are so off course for Ibapa, and uh, you've got to go way back and around." And they show them how to do it and, um, and or, you know, can, can give them a, a map and uh, they, they end up pulling into Eva Pot about five o'clock in the morning and they are frozen. It's, you know, it's in the desert, the high desert, it's cold at night even though it's blazing hot during the day and, and uh, they're just frozen and they, they uh, at the ranch they pack them full of coffee and, and sandwiches and they, they, they take off for Salt Lake City because they, of course, they have a big event in Salt Lake City. They can't be late for that. And, and um, the road's washed out, so they got to go 80 miles out of their way. And uh, so they just keep going. They leave the ranch at 8 and they, they finally pull into Salt Lake City at um, about 1 o'clock the next morning. And Sarah rode up front with the, the driver. She usually rode in the back, but she rode up front with the driver and, and just like kept him awake and, and kept him on, on the right track. So anyway, they, they do show up in one piece in Salt Lake City, and, and uh, they have this big um, event on the steps of the Capitol, which uh, if you've been to Salt Lake, it's a beautiful capital it's sitting way up high over the city. Um, and uh, so here are the two Swedes, and um, Sarah's on the other side. And, and um, this is one of the, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but she's um, just a, um, one of the really venerable uh, members of the suffrage movement in Utah. Um, and uh, a lot of people sign their petition, and they're off and, and running on, on the next stage of their, their journey. You can see they're all wearing these sashes are in the purple, white, and gold colors of the National Women's or the Congressional Union. Um, that's what those sashes are. Okay, next slide. Um, so they, they go across Wyoming, and um, and this isn't again not a scene from their not a slide from their trip, but um, they have to get they get they get to. Um, uh, uh, Laramie, and they've got to get over the mountains to Cheyenne the next day because there's going to be a big event there, there and the governor's going to be there supposedly. And, and, um, and uh, but they wake up in the morning and there's it's snowing and the wind is blowing. And again, I mean, if you have been out there, I mean, Laramie is this on this big windswept plain. I mean, the wind must have been tremendous. And they, they, they on their way to the to the base of the mountain pass that they have to climb over to get to Cheyenne, they, they see all these cars coming the other way. And there are men who, are, who tell them, stop, turn back. It's not safe. You can't make it over the pass today. And they're like, we have to go. So they did. They made it over. They were the only car to get over the pass that day. And they, they made it in time for their, for their uh, event. Um, all right, next slide. But this is sort of one of the adventures they had. So now here they are in Denver. Oops, and you can, um, you can see they're starting to look a little sunburned, and, um, and uh, they've, lost, they've all lost weight. Um, this is Ingeborg. She's looking pretty brown. And um, because they, 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 can, they can drive with the car top up, but it traps the fumes. And um, so they, they kind of prefer not to if they can avoid it. Um, so they have a big event in Denver. Um, and things are going pretty well. I, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but uh, Sarah Bardfield had kind of a dicky heart. <laughs> She's not, I'm not really uh, clear on what exactly was going on with her heart, but she was not well during a lot of this, this trip, especially at the higher elevations. It seemed to really monkey with her heart, and she was not, not healthy. And of course, um, before they left S San Francisco, Alice Paul had told Sarah, you're the speaker. You know, these two women, they speak English with an accent. They don't speak English that well, and they aren't educated. So we don't want them up on the platform talking. They can be, they can have their photos in the paper, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have them giving speeches. And um, that was fine with Maria, but 
it really pissed Ingeborg off so that she couldn't be a speaker. So um, that, there's some drama around that a bit later. But um, the other thing I, I think I forgot to mention was um, Sarah uh, had hoped to be pregnant um, when uh, she wanted, uh, her lover came down from Oregon to visit her before they took off. And, um, and, but by the time they pulled into um, Salt Lake City, she had her period, she knew she wasn't pregnant, and, um, and she was just completely distraught by this. She would really wanted to, to have a baby with Erskine. And, um, and uh, I just can't imagine how that would have played in D.C. when she pulled in there in December pregnant. But anyway, that was, she didn't have to have that problem after all. Um, so, all right, next slide. Um, so here they are. So they're still in, uh, they're in Colorado Springs now, and, and um, this is Mrs. Mrs. Bertram Fowler, who's the head of the, the Colorado uh, branch of the Congressional Union. And they all look a little grim, I think, at this point. <laughs> and they haven't had a day off in a while. That was a big problem, big source of tension with them and Mabel, because Mabel's just like, go, 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 visit every town you can. And, and um, every time they came into a town of any size, they would stop put up that We Demand banner and decorate the car with flags and signs and stuff. And then they would, they would go into the town and stop and do a speech or something. If it was a really big town like Denver or Colorado Springs or you know, Salt Lake City, then they'd, they'd have a big event at, a, at you know, the Capitol or someplace like that, or the courthouse and the governor or whoever they could get there would be there. Um, and uh, so they, you know, Mabel was just like, you know, go everywhere you can and stop and do a speech, and it was it was exhausting because the travel was not easy. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so they make it across Southern, Southern Colorado to Kansas, and um, they're on their way. Up, they're kind of getting up to um, this one town in Kansas. I'm blanking on the name. Will come to me where uh, Sarah has an interview with the, the uh, newspaper editor there and it's got, you know she's really determined to get there she says well it's it's raining it's a nasty day why don't we take the shortcut and uh, the Swedes are like ah, we're not so excited about this shortcut they do have a map now but uh, they they're but she insists that no we should take the shortcut it'll be so much faster well they get stuck and it's 10 o'clock at night when they get stuck uh, they're, again, this isn't their trip, that's not their car, but they're out there in the middle of nowhere. They can see the lights of farmhouses. They know their farmhouses within walking distance or you know, a mile or two, but they, they call and call, no one comes. And so you know, they're just sitting there in the car and finally Sarah says, ah, I, I'll go. And it's like, you know, she later claimed it was like thigh deep or hip deep mud that she had to wade through in places to get they know there's a farmhouse back a mile or two in the road. And so she goes back there, she routes the farmer, he hitches up his mules and brings them out and, and hauls them out of the mud hole. And um, they get to the next little hamlet and just hammer on somebody's door who's not happy to be woken up early in the morning. Um, it's you know probably like four o'clock in the morning by the time they get there. And they say, well, you can sit in the kitchen, but we're not gonna get the fire started and we're not gonna give you any food or coffee or anything. But so they waited until daylight and then they, uh, got into to the next town where they were had where they were supposed to have spent the night, and so they walk in. They're covered with mud, and and um, you know Sarah has to uh, she has to send her clothes out to be cleaned, and and then do the interview with the newspaper editor in her bed with her covers hauled up to her chin, and um, so just one of those little funny stories. But um, all right, next story. Next, I mean, next slide. Yeah. So here they are. They're in Nebraska, and. Um, Usually, what they in these bigger towns, what they would do is is um, uh, they would uh, Mabel would have arranged for an advance a, a band like a marching band to to escort a whole line of cars into the city center. So they'd meet on the outskirts of town, and however many women they could drum up in their cars, they'd have this car procession into wherever they were going to have the mass meeting. But in, in Nebraska, they had so little support that the, all they could get was this little bugler. <laughs> Oops, she's. Um, I, oh, I'm not sure what that is. Um, anyway, so there he is, the bugler over there on the right. Um, Sarah later recalled that they, uh, they had really good support in the West, and it kind of uh, dwindled as they headed to the middle of the country. Uh, and then as they got closer to the east, 
the eastern states were were much more excited about it because they had almost given up. They just there had been no. They had tried so many times, and they're, you know, they just couldn't seem to get suffrage through any of the state legislatures in the east. Um, all right. So next slide. Oh, so let's talk about the petition for a minute. So when they left. Uh, San Francisco, they said they had a petition with 500,000 signatures on it, and it was supposedly over 18,000 feet long. Um, so all of a sudden, you start seeing this in the, in the correspondence, you start seeing these letters um, coming to Mabel saying, do you guys have that petition? Do you? And then she's like, wait a minute, no, we don't have the petition. We thought you guys have the petition. Who's got the petition? They don't know where the petition is. And then it's like, well, how do we know we have 500,000 names on it? And, um, and it's like, well, I don't know. I think Alice came up with that number. So I, you know, I think there's reason to believe that Alice Paul simply made that number up um, because you know, 40,000 signatures might not sound very impressive for something to come out of you know, something as huge as the, as the Panama Pacific Exposition. And it certainly wouldn't impress Congress. Um, a big state could deliver 40,000 petitions. Uh, so it had to be a big number and, and uh, who knows you know, how they came up with it. It doesn't, uh, interestingly, the number doesn't change on the way across the country. It always stays at 500,000. So, and this, but all, it's always, there's always this reference to, you know, the monster petition. So, um, I think that's funny. And, and then they, they finally get this, you know, they, there's this sort of flurry of, of uh, letters. They, didn't, they don't do it by telegram because, of course, they can't afford for that to get out. But I think they solved their problem in Detroit because there are some very staunch congressional union organizers in Detroit who um, hustle and get 4,000 signatures ready for them by the time they show up. And, and that solves their problem. All right, next slide. Um, so this is like the only picture of, of uh, Ingeborg smiling, I think. Um, and they're in Chicago. Um, things are going pretty well, and uh, yeah, let's keep going, I guess. Um, so they make it as far as Brooklyn. Um, you know, a little bit of background, I think in, in Syracuse, outside of Syracuse, they break an axle, and they, they have to send back to Dayton for a new axle, and, and there's a big sort of to-do about that, but they, they actually, it happens pretty quickly, and, and, um, and they were able to keep going and meet, get to their meeting. There's only one meeting they don't get to at all, uh, and it's because they got lost and they had a, a mechanical breakdown as well, and that was in Topeka. Um, so here they are in Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> and um, Ingeborg is rocking a very excellent hat, and, um, and uh, they're going, this says, on to Congress, you can see in the front windshield of the car. Um, so they're looking a little grim, but they're, they're still they're sort of making it. I, you know, somewhere along the way, I had mentioned that Ingeborg was really upset that she wasn't allowed to speak because she had actually formed a suffrage organization back in Providence because I think, I suspect it's because the more affluent white women uh, didn't allow her to, you know, what didn't really encourage her to be involved in the mainstream suffrage organization, so she, she created her own. And, um, and so she was, she was really a committed suffragist. And, um, and she, and they had a good story to tell. I mean, they were immigrants. They, they were partners. Um, we're not quite sure exactly what that meant, but I mean, whether I think they could, they were at least business partners, and they lived together. Um, but, uh, and and so and and they had both, uh, you know, made it on their own. They were never married, and they had earned enough money so that they could travel um, and buy a car. I mean, they they had a good story to tell, and. They, you know, they weren't allowed to tell it, and I think Ingeborg was pretty pissed off about that. And so at one point, she says to to um, Sarah, "Before this trip is over, I'm going to have to kill you." <laughs> and Sarah at the time was just like, "She meant it." You know, I was a little nervous, and they're out in the middle of nowhere, of course, but but um, that never really happens. Um, and she claimed that Ingeborg had been in a mental institution, you know, for some time prior to this trip. So. Uh, she was, you know, there was some concern about her mental health, but Maria was very sweet and, and motherly, and everybody liked her. Um, all right, so next slide. Uh, and they're, I think they're getting into to New York City at this point. Um, there's a big parade in New York City, and they're, they're so, 
the Eastern suffragists were just so excited that their Western sisters were coming to their aid. This is a new strategy and it really was a shot in the arm. All right, next slide. Um, so they finally make it to, uh, to DC. Um, they, I think they ended up loading the car onto a boat in, in New York City and sending it down to Baltimore because it's just too freaking cold uh, to, to drive it in the, in the cold weather there, to do a long distance trip like that. Um, so this is a, you know, a, a big banner or a bulletin board kind of thing for welcoming them. Um, so next slide. Um, so they have this procession down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol in D.C. And they, now, you know, they, this is often they used, even though they were increasingly using automobiles in parades as a sort of symbol of women's new freedom and ability to move around without men, they, they still used horses and got dressed in costumes and things like that. Um, and all right, next slide. Um, so here they are, they're, they're approaching, the, they're coming up towards the back of the Capitol there, and um, the banner says, uh, we demand the passage of the Bristow-Mondell Amendment, and Bristow and Mondell were, of course, the, the congressmen who, were, who had introduced it, or were going to introduce it that day in Congress, actually. They, they, that was pre-planned that they were going to arrive in D.C., have this event on the opening day of Congress, and they were trying to allow, to get, um, uh, Sarah to be able to, to address Congress from the floor, but they were never able to pull that out off. But they did get Wilson to agree to see them later in the afternoon. So um, here they are, they're coming up. All right, next slide. And there's the uh, Overland Six and the envoys getting out of the car. Um, you can see people are starting to assemble. All right, next slide. And here's where they've, they've solved their, their um, their petition problem. They have it, all those names are, you know, pieces of paper are taped together in a big um, roll and they're kind of rolled around the spindle and they unfurl it as they walk up the steps. So you can see those 4,000 signatures they got in, in, in uh, Detroit really helped them. Uh, so, all right, next slide. Um, so there they are on the steps of the Capitol. Uh, I think this is Alice Paul actually right there. Um, and I don't see the Swedes there, but um, anyway, they say it was quite a big event, you can see. And uh, all right, next slide. Uh, there's another view of that. And so, you know, when they go to see Wilson later in the day, they, they take that, that spool and they just throw it across the floor and, and unfurl it. And uh, so he can sort of see, get a sense of how many signatures are there. And, and they say to him, look, you know, you have you had changed your you've changed your mind on other things like you change your mind on preparedness for World War One you can change your mind on suffrage and in fact he had when he was first elected in in 1912 he had said he didn't really know anything about suffrage and hadn't thought about it much and then by 1915 he had progressed to saying yes I think women should have the right to vote but it should come through state action and um, so what th they needed to get him the next step, which is to support the federal amendment. And that's the pressure that they were putting on him. And, and it turned out he didn't, um, they think that they did move him because he had, they had released his speech that he was going to deliver. They had released it to the press, but he didn't deliver it. And he said some other things instead. And so um, they think they did have an effect on him. And ultimately, uh, once the US entered World War I, he went to Congress and said, you have to pass this. I need women. We need them to fight this war. We need them to fight the peace, and um, you know, or to, to make the peace. And um, and my hands are tied. You need to pass this this federal amendment. And so he he did end up uh, helping some anyway, at least not standing in the way. Okay, next slide. So there they are, that fantastic four. Um, you can see Mabel looks a little bleary, and, um, and they all look kind of worn, but they really did an amazing thing. Uh, next slide. Um, I think it was a brilliant political stunt. It had never been done before on this level. It raised awareness across the country, because in the Western states, a lot of the women didn't really realize. I mean, there wasn't this 24-hour media cycle or news cycle. You know, there wasn't the internet and things like that. People didn't realize that women in the East still couldn't vote. Um, it built support for the federal amendment. There was actually the other more conventional, you know, long-term state organization, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, 
had introduced into Congress um, a rival federal amendment, which would have been a disaster. And so it built support for this amendment, which they also called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, because it was what she had, had written and had introduced in, into Congress many decades before. And it certainly improved the visibility of the Congressional Union, it attracted new volunteers, and kind of, you know, was a real shot in the arm. And it changed the paradigm. It said it was okay for women to, you know, muck about in politics and, and, um, and be uppity. And uh, not everybody liked that. They, they did get a lot of pushback, um, but um, it, it did a lot for them. So that, that's the trip. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is, I don't, it's a little hard to read this, so I'll read it. This is a quote from Alice Paul at her, um, it's, they have a, her, turned her ho childhood home in New Jersey, um, Paulsdale, into a museum, and this is from there. I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated, but to me there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. Just a great quote. And um, uh, so next slide. This is the language of the 19th Amendment. It was 72 years from the time of the Seneca Falls Convention. It took them 72 years to get this through Congress. Well, I mean, that's not quite true because it wasn't introduced to Congress until later, but I mean, 72 years to get women the right to vote. Um, very simple statement. Um, the next slide. Um, so this is the Equal Rights Amendment, which looks a lot like the 19th Amendment, which has never been ratified. Uh, and. Alice Paul introduced it in Congress in, in 1923. It was um, not, uh, didn't pass Congress until 1974. Uh, and it, it was, this Congress gave them seven years. Um, they couldn't get it done. They were three states short. Uh, and they ended up sort of just falling apart. I mean, Reagan was the president. The country had moved to the right. They just didn't think, they thought they would have to start all over. It turns out, um, there's sort of new life has been breathed into the ERA process. You may be aware of that, but two states in the last two years have ratified. Uh, the first was Nevada, much to my surprise, because uh, when I was going through there, it was still pretty conservative. And, um, and uh, the other, I think most recently, was Illinois. And um, so they are now just one, we're one state short. Um, and I would look at North Carolina. I think that its demographics have changed enough. It failed in Virginia in this last year, so um, I think we're kind of looking at North Carolina. They, they seem to be doing it very quietly. There's not a big you know, national rah, rah, rah push for it. Um, they're just kind of quietly getting it through these state legislatures, and no one knows what will happen once that last state ratifies. But in the early 90, 1990s, there was a, an amendment that, had it passed at the time it was initially proposed, would have been the 11th Amendment to the Constitution, and it had to do with congressional pay. So, uh, so you know, in, in the early 1990s, whoop, it gets ratified by the last state, and, um, and uh, suddenly it's, you know, the 26th Amendment or something like that, 20, 25th or 6th Amendment. And, and this, in, uh, you know, all the women's rights activists, are you kidding me? You know, you gave us seven years, and then you gave us a little extension, but, I mean, this has been all this time, and, and um, and, uh, you know, we need more time on this. So, uh, you know, of course, we have the president we have. We have, you know, we don't have the Senate. Um, so it would certainly pass the House, but, um, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess what will happen if they get that last, once they get that last state to ratify. But uh, anyhow, it's a, it's a, we'll see what happens next. All right, so next slide. Um, just some, some um, information. I blogged about my trip in 2015 um, at suffragedroadtrip.com. Um, that so that you, it's just you know more of my interviews and sort of learnings as I talk to leagues of women voters and women's rights activists. The the main suffragecentennial.org is um, a new organization of a sort of a diverse group of organizations and and um, and individuals who are just trying to promote the um, the hundred year anniversary of women's suffrage or the 19th Amendment getting ratified and passed. Uh, so that's our new logo and that's our new website. Um, the Maine State Museum is going to have a, a suffrage themed exhibit um, and, and because Maine ratified in 1919 and because next year, the 2020 is our bicentennial, the Maine State Museum is going to do this exhibit in 2019. It opens um, next month. And then Florence is my great grandmother and this is her website. So. Um, 
that's information there. And just go to the next slide. And that's my contact info. So, any, any, that's it for me. Any, any questions? Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, most people think that it's because the East was just, uh, had been settled, I'm sorry, I should say, it, the East had been settled, um, you know, by, by Europeans much, for, for much longer, and, um, and it, it took a lot of the conservative values of, the, of Europe you know, were, were sort of baked into the culture and the laws of, of the East. And even though a lot of those same people did migrate to the West, all that stuff went out the window when you were out in the frontier and you didn't have any servants or anybody, you know, the women had to be out in the fields and, um, and doing, you know, they had to be shooting game or doing whatever they had to do to survive. Um, and also in, in, in states like Wyoming, there were so few women um, that the men seemed to think that it would be you know, advantageous if they offered women the right to vote, like it might attract a few more women out there. And <laughs> so um, th that's generally what people think are, is the reason. A lot more, and, and including in 1917, Alice Paul starts picketing the White House, and the Congressional Union starts, they start picketing the White House, and they're literally standing on either side of the, of the White House gates, and so the, when the president drives in and out, he tips his hat to them. I mean, you couldn't do that today, now there are all these barricades, but, um, and it was, you know, later in 1917 where they start, they start having these banners which say kind of nasty things about the president and, um, and get, they get arrested and thrown in jail. Alice Paul goes on and other people get, go on hun hunger strikes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's a whole lot of publicity around that. Later in 1918, they're burning the president in effigy in this park across the, from the White House that doesn't go well, uh, go down well in, in conservative places like Maine. Um, and so, but they did those things, they had to do those things because they needed to bring attention to the fact that this amendment was stalled in Congress. And they finally did get it through the House, I think as, even as early as like um, 2000, I mean 1918 or early 2000, uh, or, yeah, I think it was like uh, 1918 that it gets through the House, but they can't get it through the Senate. And um, so they, they just have to keep figuring out ways to ratchet up the pressure. And this, this was one way. This was actually, this whole trip was a giant heads up to the Democrats, but mostly, um, because they knew the next year was the 1916 election. And basically they're saying, uh, you know, we're going to come after you. In, in fact, they have a meeting um, in front of a, the Judiciary Committee, I think, in the, in the Congress. Uh, in December of 1915, so after the road trip is over, they go talk to Congress and, and the congressman asks them, are, are you going to come after us in 1916? And Alice Paul says, well, that depends on what you guys do. And, um, and, and in this next session of Congress, we want you to move this thing through. And they say, well, did the Republicans hire you to do this? And, and she says, well, you know, we're, we're really pleased that you think that we're so, you know, we have, can have such an effect that the that, that Republicans would hire us. But no, we're not. We're nonpartisan. And they, they just kind of go back and forth with this. And, and, um, but they're, bas you know, they're saying, yeah, it depends. We're going to come after you for sure. But it depends on what you do. If you get this through Congress, we won't have to. Um, but in the end, they, they do. Um, Congress doesn't move it. And they do in 1916 go send organizers back into the western states and try to persuade the women uh, to vote against Wilson and against whatever the Democratic candidates are um, in that in that election. And my great grandmother, by the way, went to Wyoming in that election to do that kind of organizing. Alice Paul sent her out there. Um, well, President, uh, you know, Wilson was reelected, but they did claim they, they narrowed his margin. You know, maybe that would have happened anyway. I don't know. But, uh, and then, um, uh, but they did, they think, defeat a couple of congressmen along the way, and they certainly narrowed the majorities for a number of them. So the, the real, they're, they got stuck, uh, or they got, the timing was bad because of World War I, and a lot of, because Wilson was campaigning under the banner of, uh, or the slogan of, he kept, he kept us out of war, and, um, and so the suffragists campaign, uh, he kept us out of suffrage, and they would literally have that banner hanging from their platforms when they spoke. Uh, but people were really worried about getting sucked into World War I, and they thought that Wilson was going to keep them out of it. And, um, and so they, that was why they, they voted for him. And um, so they, 
you know, had that had World War One not been an issue, you might have seen a different outcome. <clears throat> well, the mainstream suffragists didn't like it at all. They were um, my great grandmother um, ended up getting kind of written out of main suffrage history because she was the only she was kind of the lone voice speaking publicly on behalf of the picketing and the uh, things like that and supporting the the what well the Congressional Union National Women's Party. In fact, she served as the the chair of the main branch of the of the National Women's Party from its inception. But yeah, no, it was it was Maine was very conservative and they didn't like this militant stuff at all. They thought it was yes, yeah. I mean, isn't that interesting? I I think it, and picketing was you know not unusual uh, at all in the labor movement at that time. But it, for women to do it. Um, and, and for women just to be out, you know, trying to exchange their, their political power, um, you know, for, for progress on the causes they supported uh, or was, was very, considered to be very unladylike. And when Florence, when my great grandmother was on her way out to Wyoming, she was, it's a, the picture on the front cover of the book was, a, was a, her first big picket event, and that was in Chicago. Wilson was in town to do a speech, and they um, they they are all lined up along this block, and they're not saying anything. They're just holding signs that you know charge Wilson with inaction on this suffrage amendment, and um, and but when he enters the building, they get attacked by this mob of men who've gathered around them, and they try to grab the signs out of their hands, and the women won't let go, and they. They throw the women to the ground and break their signs and chase them. End up chasing them back to headquarters. And you know, respectable middle-class women did not have melees on the streets of Chicago or anywhere else, for that matter. And Florence thought this was just, you know, a huge, you know, romp. And she she had a suffrage column in the Lewis and Journal, so she writes back this eyewitness account of this of this event. And of course, the the Congressional Union made sure that made front page. You know, those are front page news all over the country, um, that event. And so by the time she got back to Maine, her suffrage colleagues were just done with her. And um, they knew that they were going to have a, 19, a suffrage referendum, Maine's first, in 1917. And they tell her at that point, you know, you can, you know, we might let you lick stamps if you're lucky, but otherwise, don't plan on having any kind of public role in this, this referendum campaign because you're far too radical. And, um, and we just can't afford to have you associated with that stuff. Yeah, Maine was, Maine was pretty, you know, in fact, there's this one organizer who's, who, the organizer used to come up to Maine and stay with Florence and her husband in their big house in the west end of Portland. Um, and this one named Julia Emery came up for several months in 1918. And, and she writes back to headquarters that, you know, these Maine, these Portland women, they're just like mahogany furniture. And I just love that description because it was so apt. You just can see it. They're just so staid and, uh, and, and unmovable. And she said they, they engage in the Congressional Union like it's some kind of secret sin. Yeah, so the eyes of the country were on Maine at several key points of the last few years of the suffrage battles. And um, one of them was our 1917 suffrage referendum in which Frederick Hale, who's one of our senators, told Florence, look, you know, I'll be guided by the people of Maine, the voters of Maine, and if they support the suffrage referendum, then I'll vote for it in the Senate. And if they don't, I'll vote against it. And so, of course, they lost the suffrage, the, the referendum on a two to one vote. It wasn't even close. And, and, um, and so, uh, you know, Frederick says, Frederick Hale says, I'm, I guess I got to vote against it. And they, but he, they know he's not, like, it's not, it's like a, not a personal belief thing for him. Um, so they still think he's on the list of, his short list of, of senators they can turn. And like I said, they've already got it through the House. They just need to get it through the Senate. And they, they're like 10 votes short. And then they're five votes short and three votes short. They just need one more vote. And it might be Hale. And so they keep sending organizers. That's when Julia Emery came up to Maine. And um, other, other organizers do too. And they keep trying to figure out how to get pressure on Hale to, um, you know, to change his vote. And, and Florence goes to him and says, 
you made that promise to me back in 1917, and I release you from it. <laughs> so he says, no, sorry, not going to work. I still have to vote against it. I might change my mind in the next session of Congress, but in this session of Congress, I think I need to vote for it, so, or vote against it. So they, one of the things they did was they went, um, this had been used successfully in a, at least one other state. They went up to the legislature and got uh, the, the main state legislators to sign a um, kind of a petition to Hale, um, you know, encouraging him to support the amendment. And they, in the end, they were only able to get about 100 signatures. And, and um, I think a, an organizer named Betty Graham came up to help Florence with that. And, and she writes back to, to headquarters, you know, you just would not believe, you'd think that, the, you know, the, the tilt of the earth on its axis is dependent on whether or not they put their name to this petition. They just, it's so ridiculous. And, um, uh, but that doesn't work. And, and uh, they get, you know, letter writing campaigns. They have a big, uh, big mass meeting where they bring in people from, um, you know, big name speakers from out of state and it just, it never works. And in the end, uh, Hale waits until the final vote is found. And then as Senate rules allow, he changes his vote to a yes. And so he down in history as having voted for the amendment, uh, even though he, he, his vote was not, you know, it could have been pivotal, but, um, but as squirrely as he was, it was superfluous. But he gets credit for it. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's great.